Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Cause our God is greater Our God is stronger God you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome in power our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us, and if our God is with us, then what could stand against, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? Oh, our God. 
God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God. Our God, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is for us, then who could stand against? Who could stand against? Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is sealer, awesome in power, our God, our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is sealer, awesome in power, our God. Our God. Amen. Join me as we pray. God, you are higher. You are stronger. You are greater. But more than anything, you are our God. You are the God that we have come to worship this morning. The God that we have come to celebrate, to lift up in praise. The God who hears our prayers. The God who speaks to us through his word and through the teaching of the the man that you have called and anointed to lead this church this time. So God, as we have gathered in this place, fill us with a sense of awe and wonder. Remind us of your great power. Remind us of your equally great compassion and grace and mercy that you have poured out upon us. God, fill this place with your love, with your presence. Continue your work in each of our lives. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Good morning. morning. It is great to see you. You can be seated for a moment. I am going to make you stand back up in a second, just so be prepared. Don't get too comfortable. But I am so glad you guys have come to worship with us today. If you are our guest, we have a a card in the pew rack there that says connect on it. And one of the great things about that card is that if you will fill that card out and give it back to us, we will connect with you. We promise. But we won't do it in any weird way. Okay? It'll just be like regular, because you don't want weird, I don't think. If you do, write that on the card. But in any case, take a second, fill that card out, and then you can get it back to us one of two ways. You can either drop it in the offering plate if you want to remain anonymous, and, or you can meet, and I think it's, today it's my wife, Cheryl, at the Connect table in this foyer. You can hand it to her. And she will, not weirdly, gladly receive it from you. Okay? So, because she's not, okay, in any case, we'll just keep our fingers crossed. Um, But we want to hear back from you. We want to know how we can pray for you and how we can minister to you and how we can tell you more about our church. And that Connect card, whether you put it in the offering plate or take it out there, that is the gift that we want you to give us today. We are glad that you have come to worship with us. So I want us all to stand back up. Okay? And then I want you to take a couple of minutes and just say something nice to the folks around you. But start with, Greg's a little odd, isn't he? Okay?
I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. It's a shelter like no other, your name. Let the nation sing it louder, because nothing has the power to save but your name. God, we praise your name. As morning dawns and evening fades, you inspire songs of praise that rise from earth to touch your heart. And glorify your name, your name. It's a strong and mighty tower, your name. Here's a shelter like no other, your name. Let the nations sing it louder. Nothing has the power to save but your name. Oh, Jesus, in your name we pray. strength to live for you and glorify your name. Your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your name is a shelter like no other. Your name Let the nation sing it louder, cause nothing has the power to save but your name. Your name 
It's a strong and mighty tower, your name is a shelter like no other, your name. Let the nation sing it louder, cause nothing has the power to save, but your Is a strong and mighty tower, your name is a shelter like no other, your name. Let the nation sing it louder, nothing has the power to save but your Good morning, church family. Um, Don Gray was, is our designated deacon this week, but um, he called me this morning early, and with all the family in town this week, he really wanted to be here because he wanted to thank this church so much. We know he lost his 100-year-old father this past week, and he had to, the church had his funeral this week, and he wanted so bad to be here to thank this church for all they did for him and his family during this time. But he woke up this morning and said, I've had too much family in town and I just feel sick. I better not come this morning. So y'all pray for, can you pray for Don and his family in this time of loss that he said. Let's take this time now to thank God for these gifts that have been provided. Dear Heavenly Father God, we come into your presence this morning, Lord, and we just thank you today. We do thank you for Gene Gray and, and um, Lord, his, and his great loss this week, Lord, and all that he did for this church, Lord, in his hundred years of of being here, God, and serving in this church, God. And we just thank you for him and the example he was. And we do thank you this morning, Lord, for each person that's here. Lord, we know that you sent each one of us here this morning for a purpose, God, to share with someone else, to be a part of someone else's life, and to hear your word, God. We pray we'll use this time of worship and time of fellowship, God, that you have given us to, to draw closer to you and to draw closer to each other as this family of God that you have brought together. Take these resources and these money that will be given today, God, to serve this church, to serve this community, to serve this state, nation, and world, God. And help us as a church, Lord, to make the decisions to, to use this money, Lord, to, for your glory and for your honor. We pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is only bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine, I can sing all the time, yet not I, but through Christ in me. is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold my shepherd will defend me through the deep 
deepest valley he will lead oh the night has been won and i shall overcome yet not i but through christ in me I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold. My sin has been defeated, Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released, I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. breath I long to follow Jesus for he has said that he will bring me home and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne to this I hold my hope is only Jesus, all the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, till my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, Still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Hello, today I'm reading Philippians 1, 12 to 20. It's pages 1172 in the Black Bibles. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Croatian guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak of the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of self, selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress from my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through my prayers and provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that, I will, but that with all boldness Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Amen. This is the word of God. 
Thank you, Tyler. Great job, brother. Cody, Tyler's his brother. That's okay. My mom called me Riley my whole life. It's my brother's name. Let's pray together, church family. God, we thank you for your spirit that is in this room with us. For your love that holds us close. We thank you for your grace that assures us of our walking with you throughout all eternity. We thank you for your word that guides us. Lord Jesus, we ask, Father, now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts would be pleasing in your sight. Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, thank you, uh, musicians. Uh, Beautiful music today. And I want to especially thank all the members of our E-team for putting on just a wonderful light bulb outreach uh, yesterday on Airport Road. It was really a a joy and an honor to get to be a part of that. I think a wonderful ministry uh, happened over there yesterday. Uh, We invited a whole bunch of people to church, and so if you see somebody new, make sure you welcome them. Uh, And if you are new today, I want to say welcome. We're glad you're here today. Thanks for being a part of our church family. We are in Philippians chapter 1. If you want to open a Bible there, we're going to be in a little bit of a different part of Scripture than where we have been. Lewis Myers writes in his book, A History of New Mexico Baptist, these words about a guy named Hiram Reed arriving in Santa Fe in the summer of 1849. Myers says that Reed said this, When we arrived in Santa Fe, I was so reduced in strength that I was scarcely able to walk. Due to the constant and excessive labor, my hands were swollen to twice their size, making it difficult for me to hold the reins to drive my team. That would be a a team of animals, not a football team. He's come into Santa Fe in 1849. He said, Mrs. Reed helped as much as her physical strength would allow. Can you imagine what Santa Fe must have looked like in 1849 when Hiram Reed arrived here? He'd been sent as a missionary. He was sent by the Baptist Home Mission Society back east, not to Santa Fe, but to California. But on the way to Cali, when he arrived in Santa Fe, something happened. Reed says this, The governor, and I think this would be the military governor, John Washington. The governor received me with great cordiality and without ceremony informed me that he had been apprised of my coming. And with much earnestness and with many arguments, he solicited me to abandon my intentions to proceed to California and to remain in Santa Fe as the chaplain of this post. That would have been Fort Marcy. Reed says, I showed the governor the instruction from my board as a missionary to California and stated that no ordinary circumstances could justify me changing that commission. After perusing the document, he replied that I might travel the world over and in his opinion, I could not find a darker or more desolate place than Santa Fe. I'm not trying to take a dig, but it's just what he said. He urged me to look the city over, a field with 6,000 inhabitants, one-tenth of whom are Americans, and then to look at the 100,000 souls in the territory of New Mexico, among whom there was not a single Protestant minister. I share this with you today because in many ways, the spiritual darkness and desolation (laughs) that we laughed at, that the governor was trying to use to convince Hiram Reed to stay in New Mexico is still apparent, isn't it? Many wonderful works of the gospel have happened here since 1849. Our church began during that time and then eventually many others were planted since. Many are flourishing today. But still, I wonder if you can see our state, our city, with spiritual eyes. Can you see the darkness that that governor was trying to point to? 
You know, New Mexico repeatedly ranks last or close to last in a variety of categories in the 50 states. We just recently took back over that precious place as last in education in the United States. We often are close to last in health care, in violent crime, and the like. One need only watch the news at night to realize something's not quite right. There's violence and murder and theft. But the question is, what is to be done about all that? What could I or you possibly do to affect such deep and wide-ranging problems? Well, I want to tell you a story this morning about another pagan empire. The Roman Empire. Probably more dark. Probably much more desolate We're going to take a look by taking a break from our study in Luke and be here in Philippians chapter 1. We're about to enter a season of many wonderful outreach opportunities. We had a great one on Saturday. And this morning, my hope is to encourage each one of us to take seriously and excitedly our opportunities to share Jesus Christ in Santa Fe. That's my motivation. Just this coming Saturday, we'll have a tremendous opportunity to invite families, young and old, to come walk around cool cars and decorated trunks at our fall family day trunk or treat and encounter the gospel while they're here. And a few weeks after that, we have the opportunity to nominate families to get a Thanksgiving basket just as means of encouragement and to outreach to them. We're now collecting Christmas shoe boxes that you'll see start collecting and growing in this room. Our living nativity in a couple of months will have a new team, the ministry team, focused solely on ministering to people who come and attempting to reach them with the gospel. As we approach this season with all these outreach opportunities and just as we interact in our beautiful city on a daily basis, My hope this morning is to direct our eyes and hearts to what each one of us might do to help those living in darkness. Let's look together at verse 12. Philippians 1, verse 12. Paul says, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ... Okay, so let's think about what he's saying. Where is he? He's literally in prison. Notice he says in prison. It's most likely in Rome. And who would think that that God could use Paul there in prison? In the New Testament, the cultural background of most of what we read in the New Testament is it's a very relativistic society. They had all kinds of gods. You have Israel that had been conquered by Rome. Egypt that had been conquered by Rome. Most of the known world conquered by Rome. (laughs) And Philippi, the recipients of this letter, was really a center of Greco-Roman culture. It carried the name Philip. This is the father of Alexander the Great. And Philip was known for his patronage of the Greek arts. Tutored by Aristotle, then his son, Alexander, founded Greek cities across Western Asia to be centers of Greek language and entertainment. And the conquest of Alexander made Greek, uh, particularly Koine Greek, common Greek, the means of communication and government and business throughout the Hellenized world. And then later, Rome came in and conquered them. So later under Roman rule here, Philippi, Mark Anthony and Octavian defeated Brutus and Cassius, Julius Caesar's assassins, on the plains right outside of Philippi. So Philippi then became a Roman colony, and particularly they ended up discharging all of these Roman army veterans. One of them was one of the founders of the Philippian church, but uh, Philippi was really a center for discharged Roman army vets. So Philippi and Rome were these mixed, pluralistic cultures. Religiously, people worshipped every kind of god you could imagine. Whatever gods they might have had before these conquering empires came in, they still worshipped. They worshipped Caesar. They worshipped Greek and Roman deity figures. Some of these people, uh, these worship practices, practices involved killing babies. Some of the worship practices involved sex things right out of 2023. 
Roman society was also brutal. They killed Christians on crosses, sometimes even putting them in the arena. That probably happened a little bit later than the writing of Philippians. More often, they oppressed Christians with imprisonment or not allowing them to have certain jobs. That is happening. Paul's in prison. Typically, Roman society didn't care who or what a person worshipped as long as that person showed civic dedication to Caesar. And they did this by worshipping Caesar publicly. They would publicly burn incense. And oftentimes, Christians are getting in trouble in the New Testament because that's the one thing they wouldn't do. They wouldn't do other things, but that's what people noticed. They wouldn't publicly burn incense to Caesar. They often found themselves getting in trouble and later being put in the arena or killed on crosses. By the writing of Philippians, persecution is probably not at at its worst. But Paul is in prison. And so what in the world could he do in chains? So as we think about the brokenness of the world that we live in today, I want you to notice, first of all, in your sermon notes, when our circumstances seem bleak, when the news might not seem to be able to get any worse, when you wonder how in the world can I do anything, first, no matter your circumstances, proclaim Christ. No matter your circumstances, proclaim Christ. One thing that we can see all throughout Scripture, and again here in Philippians, is that trials and hardships can actually help gospel growth. When we're going through hard times, it can actually cause the gospel to flourish. Look there again with me at verse 13. I stopped in the middle. So that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole praetorian guard and to everyone else. Your Bible may say palace guard or imperial guard. The Greek word is just one word and it's praetorio. Praetorio, and we know from secular history who these people were. The Praetorian Guard were the special bodyguard to Caesar. But in Rome, that's sort of our secret service, but scarier. Uh, in Rome, there, there's only one Caesar, the emperor, the king, and this was a group of 9,000 elite soldiers that guarded Caesar. They sometimes even exerted control over Caesar himself. They had, uh, at times, deposed and promoted Caesars. In 41 AD, which could be right after the writing of, right before the writing of Philippians, they had assassinated Emperor Caligula and promoted Claudius to the throne. Later, they guided the directions under Nero's reign as Nero lost his mind and went crazy. Now, it just so happened that Paul is in prison under the guard of the Praetorians. I'm here to tell you, anytime we say it just so happened is code word for God did something cool. Well, it just so happened that God did something cool by locking up Paul with the Praetorian guard. People have joked, can you imagine being chained up to the Apostle Paul? That guard didn't have a prayer. But but this statement in verse 13 would have been breathtaking to the Philippian church. Who did you say has heard about Christ through you? I thought he said the Praetorian guard. Did he say that? This is like saying Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift are going to play rugby now and sing Christian music. It's like saying Prince Harry and Meghan Markle are going to serve communion in our church next Sunday. Saying my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else is a profound statement of the gospel spreading to the upper echelons of Roman society. And it happened while Paul was in prison. And so let me ask us, church family, in what circumstances could Jesus Christ not use us? One of my favorite stories about me realizing, oh my goodness, there is a Holy Spirit who is powerful. Happened to me uh, on my first trip to China. I'd done a couple of mission trips before, but Amy and I spent a summer there uh, teaching English in the name of Christ. And at that time, China was closed to official Christian 
missionaries, but we were able to get there by uh, teaching English. And so the Baptist mission organization had a partnership with China that said we would come and teach English, but the agreement with the government then, and this has been a while ago, was that we could not use the classroom as a bully pulpit. We had to do a good job of teaching English, and we did. But we said, if someone asks us about our faith, then we have to speak and be honest about our faith and who we are. And the government said, yes, that's great. Absolutely, you can do that. And so we started then, of course, praying, okay, Holy Spirit, these are the rules for us to be in China. We can't speak unless we're asked, so would you lead the conversation? Would you provide opportunities? One day, one of the the people that I taught came uh, into, we were in our classroom having class, and they went up to the board, it's kind of a, a, a conversation time that we'd have at the end of every class to practice English, and she wrote on the board, G O S P E L, gospel. And she said, teacher, what does this word mean? And I had to pick my jaw up off the floor and say, okay, Lord, I prayed for this. Here's an opportunity to share Christ. Later that summer, I had another student bring this big, old, huge Bible, six inches thick, it seemed like. It looked a hundred years old. And, and she said, teacher, what's this book all about? Again, jaw up off floor. Let me use this opportunity now. Friends, we are not on our own to share Jesus in New Mexico. There is a Holy Spirit who wants to work actively in you and me to share the hope of the good news with a hurting world. Look at verse 14. And that most of the brethren, this is now Christians, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Now notice the persecution was on the rise. It wasn't that circumstances were getting easier, and yet their courage and boldness to speak was going up. Paul had been faithful to proclaim Jesus in prison, and the praetorian guard had heard about it, and this was encouraging other Christians to be faithful and say, well, if Paul can proclaim Christ in prison, then I better get busy in my community proclaiming Christ. Friends, I think verse 14 could apply directly to you and me this morning. Would we be encouraged by what Paul did to do what we should be doing? So what's the big deal about this gospel, Pastor? I mean, why is this gospel hope for Rome and Philippi? Why in the world? I mean, we're talking about real problems, Reed, in New Mexico. Have you seen the violence? What in the world is this talk about Jesus going to do for that? Maybe you came to church today and you're living the news. Pain, suffering, conflict between people is all in your life right now. Why is this gospel hope for you and me in 2023? Well, gospel means good news. And the gospel is the good news that God has solved the problem of sin in Jesus Christ when He substituted Himself on the cross. And all who will trust in Him will find themselves being remade anew into His image. The pain and evil that we see around us goes back to human beings, all of us wrestling this problem called sin. Sin is a a sickness of heart in the Bible, not just the wrong things we do. It is that, but it's also the heart from which we do those wrong things. And it really explains why humanity is so beautiful, why the, the creation that we live in around us, I mean, have you seen New Mexico in the fall? It's gorgeous. And yet, at the same time, we can look around and find violence and conflict that makes us think, man, beautiful, yet broken. What is that? The Bible defines it. It's called sin. And the Bible says we each have gone astray. God created us in His image. The Bible says we are beloved by Him. He didn't make us robots who are forced to love Him, but He gave us a will. And the Bible says we each have gone astray. We each have missed God's ways of love and justice and gone our own ways of selfishness and lust and hate and violence. 
And we're seeing in our society right now an escalation of these sinful patterns. Probably for decades, these sinful patterns have been on the rise. But the great news of the Bible is that God has sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, to rescue any who want His rescuing out of this deep battle with sin. If a person will turn from a life of sin and trust in Jesus Christ, if we'll put our faith in Jesus for salvation, that person will begin to see Jesus remaking us from the inside out. Listen to Paul in 2 Corinthians 3. But we all with unveiled faces beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. And that means from human glory more into the likeness of the glory of the Son. When a person turns from sin and trusts in Christ, we won't be perfect. We will still make mistakes. But God will begin a work of transformation inside of us. To make us look and act like His Son, Jesus, more and more. I think about the hope that is for a broken world. What if the world looked more like Jesus? Think about who He was and all of His glory and His kindness and yet His boldness. How He never harmed anyone, not even a sparrow. The promise that receiving the good news and trusting in Jesus will transform us into His likeness is truly hope for this world. And it was hope for Paul's world. And hope for you and me. If you never have, I invite you today to just say, God, I'm done with a life of sin. I know I'm not going to be perfect, but I'm turning to You and making You my Lord and my Savior. I trust in You. And I'm going to follow You as my King. That's how you become a Christian. To turn from sin and to turn to Christ. Christians are those people who then can see He is hope. Jesus offers hope for a broken world and they can see this hope will change, transform anybody who wants it. So Christians, we want to hold this hope out, don't we? We want to give it to other people as much as they'll receive it. Whether in prison or in Santa Fe in 2023 or on the trail in 1849, we can see that this would help people. And so in all circumstances, our goal is to proclaim Christ as Christians, just as that's what Paul says here. Though he's in prison, his goal is to let the progress of the gospel keep moving, to keep proclaiming Christ. And you might be thinking, read, this is 2023. We can't cram this message down people's throats today. They're not going to want to hear it. Well, does Paul ever say cram the message down? their throat? No. Do we really think... The Praetorian Guard was longing to hear the gospel. Do we really think they just couldn't wait to hear what their prisoners had to say as they were imprisoned underneath them? So how in the world did Paul get them to listen to him? Look with me at verse 15. Philippians 1.15 So some, to be sure, are preaching Christ from envy and strife but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. So notice second on your sermon notes, no matter your circumstances, proclaim Christ in love. In love. Paul is saying here that God can work even when people proclaim Jesus out of wrong motives. He's saying that that some do proclaim Christ out of wrong motives, but the right motive is, verse 16, love. And he says that it causes me frustration, causes me distress in my imprisonment when people proclaim Christ out of the wrong motives, but God can even use it still. God can still use that wrong preaching of the gospel to still talk about who Jesus is and people can still get saved even by a message not preached out of love but we are to be the people who proclaim Jesus in love in Ephesians 4 15 Paul says cram the truth of the gospel down people's throats no he doesn't say that we talk about it all the time I'd love for you to memorize it Ephesians 4 15 speaking the truth in love just those words speaking the truth in love. So often I hear folks saying, I'm not good at evangelism, pastor. 
I'm not good at sharing about Jesus in Santa Fe, but I love doing acts of love for people. I love serving people. I love helping people. Do you know what? I believe with all my heart that is the Holy Spirit leading you. And you should follow that leadership. You just need to learn to be ready to speak too. But if we're just really nice people and refuse to open the Word of God and speak the Gospel, then we're just nice people. And, and really, we're nice people while our friends and family are, are on a destination, a destiny with, with being judged for their sins. But if we will become nice people who also have the Gospel, we become nice people who can save them from eternity of being in their sins. To be a nice person but not care if they go to hell, that's not nice, is it? But love is the overflow of the gospel-changed heart. Love is the overflow of the gospel-changed heart. And I want to say, your desire to love and care for people before speaking the gospel is the Holy Spirit telling you to earn the right to be heard by building trust as you love people. I think that desire in us in 2023 is a conviction by the Holy Spirit of, hey, don't speak yet. You've got to earn the right to be heard in this day and age. So love them. And then be ready to speak when you've earned that right. At Baylor, historical sociologists Philip Jenkins and Rodney Stark have shown that one of the key ways Christians changed the world was through their love. When a plague would hit a town in the, in the early centuries, the Christians didn't go out of the town like the rest of the town's leadership. They went into the town or they stayed and took care of the sick. In the Roman Empire, the way they dealt with unwanted pregnancies was they would leave babies on the trash heap. That's literally what they did. But the Christians were known for coming up and gathering up those children and saying, I want you. I care about you. You're going to make a difference in my life. And they took care of those kids. We have secular correspondence to and from the emperors of the Roman Empire amazed by the love of Christians. If I were to give you one piece of advice for how to share Christ in 2023 that has changed over the last 50 years, I would say this. Think less about mechanical methodologies and think more about authentically caring for people with a goal of sharing the gospel. Think less mechanical, more I want to care for you and tell you a message that is me caring for you. It's good news. Loving people and looking for authentic opportunities to allow the gospel to meet the needs of their hurt, they will feel loved by that. Over the last 50 years, and here's why I share this, sales methods that emphasize decision trees and high pressure, you ask this question and then you move to that question, and then all of a sudden, before they know it, they bought a Cadillac. Those kind of methodologies have been so overused in society that we've kind of grown smart to it, don't we? I bet when a number calls you that you don't recognize, what do you do? I ain't answering that. In the same way, an evangelist that comes up to you that you don't know and you don't know if they care about you, what are you going to do? I don't know you, right? I know you love getting calls about your car's extended warranty, don't you? <laughs> no. Today, when a person, on the other hand, comes up to you and says, hey, I want to care about you. Could I take you out for lunch or coffee just to get to know you? You're going to answer that call, aren't you? You're going to show up at that appointment. Why? Because we're human beings and we want love, don't we? We care about that. So if a person will authentically look me in the face and say, man, I care about you. Let's do blank. Let's talk about the gospel. I think it will meet the need of your hurt. More inclined to listen, aren't we? Can you imagine when Paul started caring for these guardsmen? He says the right motives is love here. And so he's saying, I'm loving these praetorian men. Can you imagine how different it was when, they start, when Paul started saying, hey, how's your family doing? Hey, you told me yesterday about your wife that keeps nagging you or how your kids don't respect you anymore. Hey, how's that going? I've been praying for you. Can you imagine how different that was of an experience for those guards than what they had experienced before that? 
at receiving love. And they were open to hearing Paul's message such that it says here, the whole Praetorian Guard had heard about him. And then it says, and everyone else. If you want to find those verses, that's the end of 13 there. Can you imagine how different it would be? Hopefully we're already doing this. When we start to care for our grocery store checker and learn her name. Or we ask our kid's sports coach how work was that day before he had to suck it up and get to the practice field to blow his whistle at all those bratty kids. Or can you imagine how different it would be if we ask our barista the next week how she's doing with her boyfriend after she confided it wasn't going well the week before. And you know what? They may get freaked out by us. I've never had a person with my coffee ask me a question like that. And you know what? Love will dictate. Hey, maybe I need to back off for a minute and just say, hey, I, I didn't mean to push too hard with you, but I'll be praying for you. And just so you know, I care about you. If you ever want to talk, this is my spot where I always sit in the coffee shop. Come talk to me anytime. If we let love be our guide, it will guide us to sharing the gospel because anything less is not loving. So Paul is loving. Look what else he is. Look at me at verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. Do you see how badly he wants us to share Christ? And he says this then. And in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. He says it twice. For I know, verse 19, that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. And look at the next verse that uh, we often take out of context, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That verse is not talking about when our parents say no to a cell phone, right? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's talking about what it means to try and share Christ with a lost and hurting world. So third, no matter your circumstances, rejoice as you proclaim Christ in love. He pulses it a couple of times there and he's in chains. He's buoyed up and full of joy about the fact that Christ is being preached even out of false motives. Think about how opposite this is from the fear that many people feel as they are going to mess up proclaiming Jesus. Paul says, even if you mess up, I rejoice because Christ is being proclaimed. He's saying, who cares if you're going to mess up? Just do your best. Talk about Jesus. He sounds a lot like Jesus when the disciples come to Jesus and say, Hey, Jesus, there are guys over there that are preaching you and they're not one of us. And does Jesus say, well, stop them? No. He says, don't bother them. Let them go. Let them preach Christ. It's exactly how Paul sounds here. So Christians can be encouraged even by improper teaching because the name of Jesus is being spread and known. So often I hear Christians want to argue about this good preacher or that bad preacher. What if we were a little bit more like Paul and Jesus? And we said, you know, as long as Jesus is being preached, I'm happy about it. Maybe we could get a little better here or there. Notice his joy has nothing to do with financial prosperity, the comfort of his home, the popularity he enjoys, the TikTok video he made. None of that. He's in prison. His joy comes from knowing Jesus. When we accept the good news of Jesus into our lives, when we admit that we too have sinned and fallen short of God's glory and we trust in Jesus, the Bible says God sends His Spirit to live inside of us. We have a personal and and corporate relationship then with God Himself. And the Christian walk really is understanding God has it under control. We're going to have victory in Christ. No matter what happens, nothing can take that victory away. Be it we lose our job, be it we're in prison. How does Paul find joy in prison? Well, he's thinking on the Word. He's praying. He's praising. He's sharing Christ. He's finding fellowship with believers. And in all of these things, he's being drawn closer 
to his Lord. Paul knows that God has forgiven his sin. Remember who he was. A murderer. Saul. A blasphemer. And God loved and forgave him and Paul couldn't get over it. I can't get over it. Can you get over it? That's where joy is found when we realize who we are standing before a holy God and yet Him saying, I love you anyways. I care about you because of my Son. Finally, I want to encourage us with one more thought. If you'll turn to the end of this book of Philippians chapter 4, the Gospel teaches us that Jesus will complete His work. At the beginning of Philippians 1.6, Paul says, I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. That's Philippians 1, 6. We are called to proclaim this message of transformation that God wants for us. And then we can rest in the fact that it doesn't all depend on us. Look at the very end of Philippians, verse 20, verse 4, 20. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Notice how badly Paul wants to leave God in the mind of the Philippians. You see that? It starts with the Father there in verse 20. And then Jesus Christ is there in verse 21 and in verse 23. The last words are about the grace of Jesus But he also says something that is so cool to me. Look at 22 again, 422. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Now, Caesar was not just some name that he was throwing. This is one guy. This is the emperor. Now, can you imagine what a mic drop encouraging ending this is to the book of Philippians? People in Caesar's house are getting saved. Wait a minute, wait a minute. The guy who's been persecuting us, wait a minute, the guy who really, Paul's responsible for you being in prison? People in his house are getting saved? He begins in chapter 1 saying the whole praetorian guard are meeting Jesus, the most elite soldiers who were Caesar's bodyguards, and he ends by saying people in his own house are getting saved in Caesar's house. Can you imagine how encouraging that was? The Roman Empire ended up falling to Jesus Christ, not by sword, but by inner transformation through the preaching of the gospel. A few generations after that, Emperor Constantine, so many people in his empire had become Christians that he was interested in becoming a Christian. People argue maybe he was doing it politically so he could curry favor with his constituents. Other people argue it was a legitimate conversion that Constantine really became a Christian. But either one of those situations illustrate the fact that Christ had been proclaimed so thoroughly through the empire that Caesar was interested in becoming Christian. A Christian. New Testament scholar Walter Hansen says Paul is probably sending his letter to the Philippians from Rome. And if so, then his letter to the Romans, sent to Rome a few years earlier, may contain some of the names of Caesar's household who had been saved that he's talking about here. If you were to look over in Romans 16, 10, and 11 in your Bible, you'd find the names Aristobulus and Narcissus. Aristobulus and Narcissus, not the narcissist that defines narcissist, different guy. Aristobulus and Narcissus deserve special attention since they are known from non-biblical history to be connected to the household of Emperor Claudius. Those could be the guys that were getting saved that Paul is talking about. He mentions in Romans 16, 10, and 11. Friends, the early church was seeing salvations in the most upper segments and the lowest segments of their society. Despite being in prison, Paul was seeing Caesar's household change for Christ. As he proclaimed the gospel, no matter where he was, as he proclaimed the gospel in love, elite soldiers wanted to hear about it. As he rejoiced as he proclaimed the gospel in love, though in prison, people were attracted to that joy. And while he rested in the confines of his prison, but more while he rested in the power of our God, the Roman Empire was changing before his eyes. I want to ask us, 
what part of our society could not be changed by the proclamation of the gospel? What hurting friend that you have or family member could not be changed as you share in love? What person around you would not be attracted to real joy as you show them what it means to know that your God loves you? Missionary Hiram Reed says about the governor who basically begged him to stay in Santa Fe, he says this, The interview was one of the most thrilling and at the same time one of the most painful of my entire career. My soul was deeply affected as he proceeded with his plea on behalf of this wicked and neglected country. The writer of the book says it was not until three days later that the missionary gave his answer. On the Sunday following the interview, Reed preached at the courthouse. The governor made a second appeal and the missionary replied in favor. He felt that God had directed him to remain in New Mexico. He would accept the first chaplaincy at Fort Marcy under an arranged uh, a, a permit that would allow him to carry on his missionary labors under the governor. Later, he wrote the Home Mission Society that had sent him to California that he would probably not need their support any longer because the government was going to pay him to be a gospel sharer in New Mexico. Reed and his wife went about learning Spanish, planting a church which the church they planted was the proto-version of our church, First Baptist. First Protestant church in the New Mexico Territory. The first Protestant pastor in the New Mexico Territory, Hiram Reed. We are all spiritual grandchildren in this room of this missionary who is able to see a vision for spiritual gospel transformation in our state. When you look out at New Mexico and see poverty, low education, need for medical care, violence and crime, do you know who can fix that? Paul knew, and he proclaimed the gospel. Hiram Reed knew, and he proclaimed the gospel. The secular commander of Fort Marcy, Governor John Washington, knew, and he begged a missionary to stay and proclaim the gospel. Friend, what message are you trying to share? When you look at your own life, do you see a situation that God has loving, joyful plans to transform you into His likeness? Because He does in Christ. We're going to have a lot of opportunities to share Jesus this semester, including Saturday's trunk or treat. Friends, will we use them? Paul saw God change Roman society while he was in prison. With whom can we not see God change? Let's pray. Father God, I thank You for the opportunity to be in this room and to talk about the awesome work that You did in the Roman Empire. God, we thank You for the awesome work that You've done in our state. And yet we all around the world, seeing the violence, seeing the conflicts, seeing the problems, we all see we need You more. We need more of your work in our state, God. We need more of your work in the Holy Land. We ask your blessings on Israel this morning. God, we pray for peace amongst the Palestinians this morning. God, and we see that you have called out a certain people to be your mouthpieces with a hurting world. And those people are called Christians. God, we ask for everyone in this room. No matter how scared we might be, no matter how frustrating we might find sharing your good news, that we would allow your Holy Spirit to fill us with power, to share in love and in joy, and, in, and then we would rest in the gospel that you've given us. As you work, as you transform, as you've given us grace, may we rest in that grace. We're going to have our time of invitation and I invite you as we stand and sing in just a minute to meditate on this word here in Philippians. Maybe today you need to commit to sharing the gospel. Maybe you've been a Christian that has said, never again. But that's not who we are. And I ask you just to ask God for His help. This is a Holy Spirit-led thing. He'll help you. 
Pray that you would see that desire to love your community that you have. That comes from God. And that we would do it. Maybe you're here today and you've never gotten right with God through His offer of forgiveness in Christ. I invite you today to, maybe you don't want to stand and sing. Maybe you need to stay seated in your pew. Or you're also welcome to come up in the steps and kneel and pray. But you can today confess Jesus as your Lord and become a Christian and worship Him. Whatever public decision you have to make, I'll be in the front to meet you and come down and talk with me too. Let's stand together as we sing. I've carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. And I see it now, laying it down. And I know that I need you. I run to the Father, fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend So I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again Oh, oh, oh You saw my condition had a plan from the start Your son for redemption The price for my heart I don't have a context For that kind of love I don't understand I can't comprehend all I know is I need you I run to the Father, fall into grace I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend So I'll run to the Father again and again And again and again again oh, 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 oh my heart has been in your sights long before my first breath running into your arms is running to life from death and I feel this rush deep in my chest Your mercy, it's calling out Just as I am, you pull me in I know I need you now I run to the Father, fall into grace I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend So I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again Oh, 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 oh again and again Church, isn't it good that a loving father sent someone to share the gospel with us? Amen. Uh, grab your bullets in. Let's take time to see what's happening in the life of our church. The Widow and Widower's Luncheon is today. 
uh, after church uh, in room 110. That's downstairs in this. You'll see. Come and be a loved on and fellowship with others. This Saturday, October 20th, is our fall family day, our trunk retreat. Um, our goal, our aim is one to share God's love uh, with families in our church and the community. And so uh, this is one of the favorite things of my job. I get to find ways where we can share the gospel in fun, loving ways. And so um, if you're doing a trunk or helping serve, please come to the church by 2 p.m. Um, I'll be sending out an email with more detailed instructions there um, coming up tomorrow. If you haven't signed up or if you don't want to do a trunk, but man, we still want you to come. Come be a part. Come see the kids dressed up. Um, Gloria's going to be here with their inflatables, uh, jumpies for the kids and doing some face painting and a lot of games. Uh, we'll be giving out popcorn, hot chocolate, side. It's going to be a nice, supposed to be a nice fall day here. So looking forward to that. Um, just come. Thank you so much for providing candy. We can still use some more candy. Um, uh, that's going to be happening this Saturday. Uh, the proposed 2024 budgets are available out in the foyer on the connect table for the next couple of weeks. You can pick one up. Uh, we are still collecting Operation Christmas Child boxes, so they're due back on Sunday, November 12th. And when you bring them, uh, the filled ones in, you can place them on the organ side there on the platform. And then lastly, this Tuesday and Wednesday, October 24th and 25th, is the annual Baptist Convention of New Mexico uh, in Albuquerque at Sandia Baptist Church. On Tuesday morning, there's a men's and women's conference that is open to anyone from our church. Um, if you haven't been familiar with uh, the denomination of what Baptists do, uh, we are really come together around the Great Commission. And so I'd invite you, if you have time, Tuesday or Wednesday, just come. You can register for free there on site. There's a schedule there in the bulletin or also on the BCM website. It should be a blessed time. That's it for the announcements. Amen. Well, thank you all for being in church today. We love you, and we'll be back, uh, Lord willing, in Luke's gospel uh, next Sunday. Let's stand. We'll have our benediction and be dismissed. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Have a great week.